Hey, good morning, Fierce. Welcome. Happy Palm Sunday. Man, I'm super excited to, to worship the Lord with you guys today. So uh, just before we jump in, I've got a couple of quick announcements. First, we're going to be together for about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, we call this the Fierce Family Room. We want you to feel right at home. So you're here, your family, just like, is that Olive Garden? Uh, Olive Garden, just like Olive Garden, minus the breadsticks, but... We're going to be together for about an hour and 10 minutes, um, and I wanted to let you know, coming up this week, we've got two services that I want to tell you about. So uh, Friday night, we have our Good Friday service at 7 p.m., um, so come on out. That's just an opportunity for us to um, get some extended time and worship the Lord together. Uh, there's not necessarily a sermon or anything, but just some, some extended time to kind of soak in the Lord's presence and worship Him and fix our eyes on, on Jesus. Um, Especially Good Friday is a great opportunity to really reflect on what Jesus did for us at the cross. So we're going to do that together on Friday. Um, and then on Sunday, we have Easter. Who's excited for Easter? Yeah. So we've got two services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., not at 10 a.m. So if you come at 10 a.m., you'll either be late or really early. So make a, make a mental note to come at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Uh, on Easter. And, and invite your friends, invite your neighbors, anybody you know uh, who you just want to drag them here and, and get them here, and uh, we're going to celebrate, celebrate and party hard that Jesus has risen, so uh, I'm super excited about that. Also, one note, so in between there, Friday and Sunday, is Saturday, and normally, if you've been coming to, who's been coming to Fierce Men or Fierce Women? Has that been awesome? Yeah. Don't come this Saturday, though. So, uh, if, you were, if you were getting into the every other weekend routine, that's not the actual routine, it's every first third or second and fourth Saturday, but on weekend or months where we've got five weekends, like this month, um, there is no fierce men or women. So uh, reset your mental calendar if you can come to that. Uh, why don't you guys stand with us? And we're going to jump in and worship the Lord together. Hey, before we do that, can I just share a little bit? So we're, we're in the beginning of Holy Week, and if you're not familiar with church history or anything like that, you might be like, what is, what is all of this about? Well, this is the time of the year where we slow down a little bit and remember Jesus' death and resurrection. But before he could die and be resurrected, he was alive on earth and he was doing all these things and people began hearing about him and they were excited about him. Um, have you heard about the whole like Kate Middleton thing lately? Like she's the princess, but she like, where is she? She's not been on there and everybody's freaking out. And she finally had a, like she came online and did a little video and she's okay, but she's, she's got cancer. And so that's why she's been gone. But there's something in the heart of people that just gets really excited about kings and queens and something that's different and, and bigger than ourselves. Well, if we were to jump into the pages of scripture, if we were to try and jump back to when people were just, they were just waiting for a king. They were looking forward to a man who was gonna solve all the problems, who was gonna make all of the wrongs right. And they began to hear about this man who loved people, who, who like knelt down in the dirt with them, who healed them, who talked and said things that nobody else could have known. And here comes this Jesus. This man who's just completely different than anybody else. And they hear that he's coming into Jerusalem and he sends some men ahead and they grab this donkey and they're like, we don't really understand, but okay, we'll grab the donkey for you. And Jesus gets on the donkey. And again, people are like, this king, he's gonna solve everything. He's gonna help us. They recognize, oh, this is the Messiah. Actually, if I, I remember when I was a little kid and I had to study the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, when, when I was a little man, I had to remember, oh yeah, that's right, the Messiah, he's gonna come riding in on a donkey. This man, everybody believes, he's the king and he's on a donkey. And they began and they, they look at him and it says on John, in John 12, verse 12, the next day, the great crowd, a great crowd that had come for the feast. It was the Passover. They were expecting a Messiah, someone to come and bring them peace. They came for the feast and they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Then they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna. Can you say Hosanna? Hosanna. That word, it means save now 
We need a savior. You look like the right guy, this Messiah we've been waiting for. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. You're the one we've been waiting for. So we're going to sing this song. And we're going to give our praise to him. And I want you to sing with all of your praise. Hosanna, save now. Our king is here. Oh, Jesus, we look to you. We lift our hands to the heavens. And we are here for you. We reach for the hem of your garment. We know what it can do. We know what it can do. We refuse to go through the motions. When the king is in the room, hear the sound of our devotion. Let it build a throne for you. Let it build a throne for you. Let everything that has breath praise, praise. Let everything that has breath praise, praise. Let everything that has breath sing a new song to the Lord. Oh, let our praises roar. Praise, praise, we praise the Lord. We've come to pour out oil, to wash our Savior's feet, every drop from every bottle. It can't compare doesn't cost us anything Cause you're worth everything Let everything that has breath Praise, praise Let everything that has breath Praise, praise Let everything that has breath Sing a new song to the Lord Oh, let our praises roll justice and 
your presence here today. There's a lot more to do, God, so I pray you'd come fill us with your spirit and speak to each and every heart, both here in person and watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. What's up, everybody? Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here, everybody online. You can go ahead and take a seat. You can take a seat if you're in your living room. Hey, if you are online and you just happen to come upon us, make sure you subscribe to wherever you are so that you keep getting us in your feed. Guys, I'm so excited. I'm so pumped to preach God's word to you today. Um, I've been cooking it up all week, dude. So I think it's going to be really good. I think you're going to enjoy it. Go ahead and pinch your neighbor. Tell him you're going to enjoy it. Nah, that was too hard. Don't pinch him that hard. Hey, Fusion, you guys are out of here. Sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Um, students, go ahead and head on out to the green light sword for your own worship experience 
You'll meet your parents in the Fierce Kids lobby right afterward. Before we start, I wanna celebrate something with you and then also issue a challenge. The celebration is, guys, we are stuffed to the rafters with Fierce Kids. There's just so many kids. We got so many doggone kids, and I love them. But hey, we've almost got too many. We've been in a little bit of a growth spurt lately, and we got a ton of kids, and here's, here's the problem. We've got so many kids that there's volunteers that they serve one week, and then they serve the next week, and then they serve the next week, and sometimes they even serve the next week. So they don't ever get to come in here because they just keep bleeding, because they care about kids and they care about parents being able to come in here and hear the message of God's word. And so I just wanna let you know about that, and I wanna ask you this question. Is it possible that Man, Jesus is being so good to us because he's sending us kids to disciple, but that also puts a burden of responsibility on us. Like, is, is it really, is it, is it kind? Is it fair to Jesus to say, hey, thanks for sending these people, but we're really not gonna take it seriously. We're not gonna go ahead and disciple them. I know that some people, you know, you don't wanna go in there because then you won't be in here. And I get that, but hey, if you've been, if you've been walking with Jesus more than five years, 10 years, 15 years, You've already heard a lot, okay? Um, at some point, we're gonna have to go to two services. Now, you know, some, some will like that, some won't, because we, we won't all be together in the same way, but we've done it before and we'll survive. Um, and when we get there, people will be able to sit one in here and then serve one, so people can always go to service every weekend. But until then, we need our family members to have our back. And so they're gonna go ahead and put up a, a screenshot on the screen with a little QR code. If you are interested in potentially helping out in Fierce Kids, go ahead and go to wherever that is on that QR code. Um, and guys, I would just tell you, man, you don't know what God might do in your heart. You, even if you're like, I don't like kids, I hear you. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe you just wanna be like one of the people that greets in the lobby. Maybe you wanna be one of the people, maybe you're like a curriculum person and you can do that. There's a lot of different roles that aren't just like, you know, face to face with kids. but. Guys, if we're gonna meet the challenge, and I think you guys are, you guys are a fierce church, I think you're gonna meet the challenge. We've got to have some backbone and say, God, thank you for continuing to send us your kids. Help us to now steward them well. Can somebody say amen there? All right. So hey, um, I was not a great student all the time when I was in high school. Uh, if I liked the class, I was good. And if I didn't like the class, I didn't really pay attention too much, guys. Like I would roll in sometimes to class and, oh, we got a quiz? I don't even know what we've been studying because I didn't like chemistry, okay? And I still don't like it. But when I would not pay attention to those classes, it got better as, as time went on. But when I wouldn't pay attention, there would, there would be this feeling of like discombobulation almost. Like, I don't, I don't really know what we're doing. I don't, she's talking about stuff. I don't get it, man. We're, I'm, I'm way behind now. I don't know where we are. And there's a consequence for that, of course. You don't get good grades. That's how that works out. Have you ever neglected something and then had a consequence for it? Maybe you got a bill and you're like, I'll get to that for sure. And then you didn't. And then it doubled, you know? And then, or maybe you got a ticket and you're like, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to go online and pay this. And then you just, you put the thing away and then you never found it again. And suddenly this thing keeps accruing more and more penalty. You ever done that? Or maybe sometimes it's, it's not just like a bill. It's, maybe it's a relationship that we just, the truth is, man, we've just been neglecting it. And now there's consequence, there's a cost. And sometimes we get into that situation, we're like, I don't even know where we are now. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Here's what can also go wrong. We can get lost even in a relationship with God because honestly, we can neglect it. We talk about God moving. Is God moving in your life? We're gonna talk about is God moving in your life today? And sometimes you might hear that and be like, I don't even know what you're talking about, man. God moving, what is that? I feel you, stick with me, man. Stay, stay with me through the sermon. Others of you, maybe you know what that's like, and maybe you at some point, you know, maybe you, you sense the Lord saying, hey, you know, maybe you're a teenager, hey, you gotta go to this youth group. He's, he's impressing on your heart. There's something in you that knows, I gotta go to this. And then you, you push it off, though, once, and then you push it off twice, and you push it off thrice, and it goes away, and you don't feel it anymore. Or maybe you've really sensed, you know, you're a little, at a little different, more advanced life stage. You know, I feel like God wants me to be intentional with some younger folks because I need to love up on them. Maybe even sometimes give them a little gift, but encourage them on their journey. And you get prompted about that once, 
or even twice, and then the prompting stop. God stops bothering you about it because you couldn't be bothered. And you don't necessarily know what that might cost. Is God moving in our lives? Possibly. Is there something that he's been trying to communicate to you and I, but we're, we're just in such a fast-paced culture. We're already so good at being distracted, and there's nothing in our culture that's gonna reward you looking for God's perspective, that's going to reward you trying to get your, your, your mind and life around what God wants. I wanna to submit to you today that God really wants us to not only know what he's doing in our lives, but know who he is who's doing it in our lives. So here's the bottom line for you. Um, more than good behavior, more than a mission, Jesus just wants to be with you. He doesn't just want good behavior. He doesn't just want you to go do stuff for him. He does want those things. But more than anything, he wants to be with you. And that's one of his lessons to his disciples. We're in a moment in today's narrative. We're a week after Easter. I know right now we're a week before, but in this passage, we're a week after the real Easter. And Jesus has appeared to his disciples several times, and he's going to appear to them a third time when they're all a group. And he's not yet giving them instructions like, hey, man, this is what I want you to do. Here's the ax stuff that you're going to go do. He just keeps showing up, and he's doing it to show them things about what he's doing in their lives, but he's doing it to show them his heart. Let's take a look. John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested. Somebody say manifest. Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. That's twice right there. First verse. He manifested himself. What do we mean by manifest? That means he showed himself. He revealed himself. He showed them some things about himself. And it wasn't just that, oh, see, like I'm, I'm resurrected. And it wasn't just, hey, you can have courage now because, see, I overcame death, and in the future you'll be able to you know, be very courageous. It wasn't just that he was revealing stuff about who he is. This word manifest, we don't have this in English. It's in biblical Greek, it's an aorist tense. That means it's a completed action that continues on and has influence in the future. It keeps affecting things in the future. So if you read a book, well, you completed reading the book, but now if that book was impactful, you keep being impacted by that book as you go. Even if you get married, okay? Well, you, you had the marriage, but then now there keeps being ripples in your life. That would be aorist tense in English if we could talk about it in such a way. This manifesting, Jesus is showing them, here's me, and I want it to keep bearing fruit in your lives. And that's what he wants to do to us today. He wants to manifest. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. That's really important. They were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. So Simon Peter, you know, it's, they're, like, they're kind of like in this, limbo stage. They're like, Jesus, okay, you're appearing to us. You haven't really given us the directions that you told us to meet you in Galilee, but also we're hungry and we still, you know, we need some money. So we're going to go fishing and make some money so that we can exist while we're waiting on whatever the next step, whatever the next plan is in Jesus's cosmic timetable. But they're together. And it's so important they're together because before they were Jesus' disciples, they weren't together. Were, most of them were spread out. They, were, they weren't necessarily doing anything together. But did you notice? Peter says, I'm going. And everyone else wasn't like prompted like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I probably, need, I probably need some fish too. No, they were used to being together. They said, Peter, we're coming too. Because we like to be together now. Before we were all separate, now we're together. And they go together to do this fishing thing. There are things about God manifesting himself to us that we can only learn together. You've got your own personal relationship with God. You do, but there's things that you'll only learn about him when you watch how he relates to somebody else, what they say God is doing in their lives, okay? So sometimes I'll only learn one aspect of God's personality when I hear about how my friend Brandon talks about him. I'm like, wow, that's, really, yeah, that is true. That's cool. I never really thought about that way, but that's, that's correct. Or my wife will say something in passing about her prayer time. I'll be like, wow, man, that. That's, that's pretty deep. Jesus never really revealed that part of himself in that way to me, but I love it that he's talking to you that way. That's what was happening with these folks. See, John knew there's ways that Jesus has communicated directly to me, but then I watch him with Peter and I see a little bit different aspect of God's personality. C.S. Lewis wrote about this in a book called The Four Loves. He said, each of my friend, in each of my friends, there's something that only some other friend 
can fully bring out. By myself, I'm not large enough to call the whole person into activity. Now that Charles is dead, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to his joke. Far from having more Ronald, now that Charles is away, I have less Ronald. Having friends, being together shows us more about who Jesus is and how he wants to relate to all of us. My friends, that's one of the reasons we encourage you to come to church and baby, come to church every time, every weekend. Do it because, not just because we like you and we want you around, but because you can learn things about Jesus only when you are around some people that you would never learn on your own. Did you notice it's, it's a body of Christ? It's a whole body. It's not appendages flung around town. It's a whole body and they're together. They're supposed to be together. They got used to being together. Now they're together again. You never know. You'll never know how much of God you don't know until you're around your brothers and sisters. 3B, they went out and got into the boat. Here we go. And that night they caught nothing. Now this is gonna be very reminiscent of Luke chapter five. This has happened before. Three years ago, this happened. It's happening again. But when the day was breaking, they caught nothing. But when the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. This is what, exactly what happened before. When Jesus first introduced himself to Peter, Peter was out in the boat all night fishing and he didn't catch anything. And Jesus said, well, go ahead and throw the, the net on that side. And they, they had too much that they, they could even carry. Now he's doing it again. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, now that's John, that's the author, that's the writer here. He's so humble that he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He's like, I ain't even important, man. All I know about me, like this is my identity. I'm just that dude that Jesus likes. Now we're all that, okay? That's really your core identity. If you follow Christ, if you've become his adopted son or daughter, that's your truest thing about you is you're the one Jesus loves. Like that's the most deep thing about you. That's how John understood himself. He said, it doesn't, my, my name's not important, just the guy that Jesus loves. He says this to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Peter, Simon Peter, we're gonna go into that. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer, outer garment and he stripped, for he was stripped for work and he cast himself into the sea. He was like, forget this, puts it on, jumps in. It's almost kind of ridiculous. They would put his robe on and then jump in the sea. We're gonna skip down to verse nine. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you've now caught or that he just caused them to catch. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Did you notice something about this? This is weird. Scholars talk about this. There's weird detail in here. Okay, if you compare this to other ancient writings like the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's not this level of detail in something that would be fiction, okay? When, when, when folks in that time are writing a story, they don't, they're not like us. They're, they're writing all the thoughts and all the, everything that happens. They don't say, and then Achilles went down to the river and you know, he decided to bathe and he started with his left arm and then he moved on to his right and he brushed his hair aside. They don't go into that level of detail because it's just fiction. And that time it wouldn't have been appropriate. Why does... John go into this level of detail. He says, it was 153 exactly. That's how many fish. He said, it was weird. He, he, put, he put his robe on and he jumped in the sea and it was kind of funny. It was ridiculous. Why is John saying that? Because John was there. This is a memory. This isn't fiction. John is saying, oh yeah, it, and it was, it was 153. I remember we had to sell that later that day. It was cool. My friend, I want you to have confidence in your Bible. Like even, you don't always understand it right when you look at it. But when you study it through its historical and grammatical and biblical context, you find out that, man, God ain't lying to you. He ain't trying to trick you. He's telling you exactly how it is, exactly the right way. Jesus said to them, verse 12, come have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to question him. Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Another way to say that is, none of them said, Jesus, is it really you? They didn't, they didn't dare to question him that because they knew it was him. Verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus manifested himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And from them, it's not that just that Jesus wants good behavior. It's not just that he's appearing to talk about his mission. Jesus wants just to be with them. Check it out. Um, he's, gonna sh he's showing them about his heart. He's saying, 
Guys, I just, I want to be together. Isn't that what he said? He said, come, have breakfast. Sometimes we feel like I got to stay away from God until I get, get things a little bit more in order. And yet Jesus would say to you and me every morning, come, come on, have breakfast. Now, it was the breakfast that Jesus caused them to catch, but he says, come, come have breakfast. And Jesus would say to you and me, hey, come, come early in the morning, grab your coffee. I gave you that coffee, by the way. Come, bring your coffee. <laughs> or sure, bring another muffin. Yeah, that's from me too. Go ahead and bring that. But let's hang out. Let's talk. I want you to see my heart. I want us just to be together. I'm not going to chew you out. I don't want you to feel bad about anything. I just want us to be. Now, every one of these, except John, of these disciples rejected and ran away when Jesus' time of trial came. And yet Jesus isn't mad. He's like, come on, let's have breakfast. Let's do this. Children, do you have any fish? He went from, first there was disciples. Then they turned into friends. Now he's calling them children. This is very much like a, a term of endearment. He's saying, oh, my little ones. There's times, even my, my older girls, okay? I'll say, oh, my sweet girl. It's because I'm a papa. And even though, yeah, she's, she's a whole woman now, to me, she's still my sweet little girl. Jesus is saying this to his guys, my boys, my guys whom I love. Come on, man. Come on over here. Let's hang out. I want you to see my heart. And he wants them to see. He's showing them also. He's manifesting to them. I'm the one who provides for you. You didn't, you didn't get what you went out there for, did you? See, Jesus knows when we didn't find what we were looking for. Jesus knows what you're disappointed with. He says, hey, never fear. I'm your provider. I'll get you what you need at the right time and in the right way. I want you to notice this about the text. You probably noticed it before. You might not have had language for it. Here and in other post-resurrection uh, narratives. Jesus is the same, but he's different. He's Jesus, and people like recognize, oh, okay, yeah, that is Jesus. They kind of know him by his heart, but they also, they kind of don't recognize him. They're like, is that Jesus? That's why they were, they're like, well, we don't, we don't need to ask, is that you? Because, yeah, we know it's you, but they didn't necessarily know it was him completely, because Jesus was the same, but he's different. This speaks to us of the fact that Jesus can be elusively mysterious and yet intimately familiar. Jesus can be elusively mysterious. You're going to find out as you walk with God, you're going to find out, even though you figure stuff out, he's always mysterious. He's always elusive. And yet, truly, he's intimately familiar. You, you, you do know him, even though you don't always recognize him. This speaks to us of we are finite beings and God is an infinite God. And therefore, even though you can know him, you'll never know all of him. There's too much Jesus. There's too much God. And it's not even just that we won't know all of him. We won't even know all of any particular part of him. So check this out. And let me give you an example first. Some of you know this. You've been walking with Jesus maybe even only three months, maybe three years. But at some point, you learned something. You're like, oh, that's cool. I'm glad I know that about Jesus. But then a little time went by, and you learned the same thing. And you're like, oh, wow, that's even cooler than I thought. It's just deeper. I knew it, but I didn't know it now, like I know it now. And then you went a little further, a couple more years, and you saw it again. God showed you, he manifested himself to you. And you're like, holy cow, I knew it was cool, but I didn't know it was this cool. That's how cool your God is. See, he's always mysterious. Even though you can know him, you can never know him fully. You can know his goodness, but you'll never know all of his goodness. You can know even the wisdom of his judgments. Yeah, I believe that God's always wise in his judgments, even when I don't understand it. You know that now, but someday you'll know it so much. You'll be like, oh my gosh, it's so awesome. I can't even believe how much I didn't know. Check this out, precious. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, 10,000 years from now, every day you'll still be blown away by God. You'll be like, oh my gosh, I knew it, but now I know it again more because you're just knowing him more. He's always too much. And yet he's not too much. He reveals himself to us. That's what he wants. That's what he wants in his relationship with us. That's a pretty doggone good God. Now, it's not just that you can't know him entirely. By the way, you're not gonna be walking around heaven after like 300 years and be like, well, seen it all. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, you'll never run out of like mind blow from God. Even though he is elusive, when we know him, we truly do know him, okay? So these disciples, it, they, really, they really did know him. And many of you, you really do know Jesus. 
You don't know everything about him. You don't know to the fullness of your will in a little while, but you truly do know him. And this is where I want to get you excited for a minute. See, in the, in the world of the Bible, we're not supposed to boast. Like it's not, it's, it's kind of frowned upon, all right? We're not to boast about how awesome we are. We're not to get puffed up. We're not to go bragging about all the things that we did and all that we accomplished because God knows you wouldn't have been able to do any of that if I wasn't helping you. But he knows pride is soul sickness. It, it makes us worse and worse. So he doesn't want us to boast about anything. But he does give us one thing we can boast about. Check this out. Jeremiah 9, 23. This is what the Lord says. Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings about justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. He says, you know, there's one exception. There's one asterisk. If you want to brag about something, brag about this, that you genuinely know the living God. And you can brag about that all day because I want other people to want it. So go ahead, fire away. What are we supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? How do we respond to God's manifest, manifesting pieces of his personality to us? Honoring God's activity in our lives, number one, run toward Jesus when you see him moving in your life. That's what Peter did. He cast himself into the sea. He's like, oh, Jesus, boom, down into the ocean. How do you know, though, when God is moving? You're like, how do you know if he's moving in your life? Well, in one sense, he's always moving in your life. We don't always discern what he's doing, but he's always moving. Think about Moses. Moses might say, well, you know, I guess God really started to move in my life when I met him at the burning bush. We say, Moses, God was moving all that time before that. Even when you were run, on the run from Pharaoh and didn't get killed, like God was still working. In, he was getting you ready all these 40 years just for this moment right now. God was active. You just didn't see it. You might say to David, David, when do you feel like the Lord really started to be active in your life? You might say, well, you know, it's, it's when Samuel came along and poured the oil of anointing on me that I was going to be king. He prophesied all this stuff on me. And we say, no, David, we know it was when you were in the field. It was when you are just a little boy. When you're tending sheep and fighting off lions and bears, God was active in you, then creating the person that you're supposed to be now. And my friends, that's what God's doing with you. He's active in your life no matter what, no matter what you see or don't see. See, God's working behind the scenes. Sometimes he's getting things into position. And other times, probably most of the time, he's getting your heart into position. See, he's, he's got a shaping ministry in each one of us. He's trying to shape us, form us into the image of the son of God. He's trying to get us ready. In other words, let me say it this way. Most of the time, my friends, it's not about waiting for God to get us to a certain point. That might be cool. That'll be great when it happens. But God, more than trying to get you there, he's trying to shape you in here. That's what he's using all the different pieces of life to do. He's trying, now we have the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we can discern that maybe a little bit more than Old Testament folks. But even so, it's still a mystery, man. So we want to watch out for always trying to... In, always trying to interpret like what the next scene is. You can be like, I think I know what God's doing. This is what's going to happen next in the movie. And check it out. He's mysterious and you didn't figure it out. And then when, when, once you finally do see some, because he drops hints sometimes and you'll get to where those hints were dropped and be like, wow, God, you're so awesome. You'll praise him. It's not that you were right. It's that he was right. And he just loves you enough to encourage you beforehand. But we want to try to not get stuck predicting what God might do. Rather, we just want to respond to him in the moment. So, my early 20s, I'm working in construction. I've just been through a church split and I'm not doing what I want to do with my life. I'm just doing construction because I can, because it's there. And I'm walking out at the end of a long, hot day and I'm getting in the car. And I'm probably a little bit complaining to the Lord in my mind. Like, Ugh. And I don't know if I said anything. It was just, just complaining, complaining heart. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, be satisfied. And it was, it was one of those like, fatherly instructions, be satisfied. That's what I need you to do. I need you to practice being content. I need you to practice the virtue of being content because I'm teaching you stuff about future things I'm gonna do with you. But I need a guy that can be content when everything isn't going the way he wants. I need a guy who isn't gonna complain and whine that sometimes life is just about going to work and then go home and love your wife and kid. And that's like, that's the season of life you're in. And that's mostly God's will. I need a guy, Carter, who understands, <laughs> I love you, bro, but I ain't your genie, okay? I don't just do what you want when you want. I got a plan here, and I will bless you, but 
It's not about you. So maybe you're in a season where you're being treated very unfairly. And maybe God is manifesting himself to you. He is revealing himself. But what he's revealing is, here's what I would do in that moment. It's hard, but I'm inviting you into the fellowship of my suffering. See, as the body of Christ, it's, it's, it's weird, but one of the things that Christians live out is, I'm embracing partially some of Jesus' suffering as part of his body. And it's really actually intimate. Jesus is saying, I don't share this with everybody. I just want to share this with my friend. This is what it was like a little bit to feel my pain. And I'm letting you feel a little bit of the rejection that I felt. Or maybe you're in a moment where you're not totally sure what God's doing, but you're learning. He's revealing to you, oh, I need Jesus. I don't just need him when things are going wrong. I need him all the time. I was going through a season when I was about 18, when suddenly out of almost nowhere, I just start to feel convicted. Like, and what that means is cut in the heart like I'm doing things wrong. Things that didn't bother me before. Things were like, no, this is great. Suddenly I'm feeling like Jesus is saying, mm, I don't like that, just you know. I don't like that. We should talk about that. And it kept continuing until the point where I said, wow, Lord, I need you way more than I thought. I need to trust you entirely for all the things I do wrong because I didn't know I was doing so much wrong. Maybe that's the lesson. It might, maybe you're in a lesson like I was when I worked at Domino's Pizza. This is a little bit after the construction time and we had a car. That's about the only thing we had. And so, hey, let's go deliver pizzas at night. Kenzie's at home with the baby. And I was with all these folks all night long who deliver pizzas. And really, dude, they're just very blue collar folks. They were just real normal. And here I'm dreaming of like, man, God, I want to do awesome things for you. I don't want to change the world. Like, I just want to be your guy. Let's, how about we fill some stadiums, God? Let's do that. And he's manifesting himself to me and saying, see these normal folks? I love them. And this is most of the people on earth. So can I trust you just to love them if I never do anything else in your life? How about you just take a year and a half and learn to love these people who are making pizzas all night long? Maybe that's a lesson like that, that you might need like I did. Maybe the lesson is just learn to love with more discernment. Maybe you're at a, a place where you keep trying to force something and you're trying to get people around in your life to do stuff. And maybe, I'm not, I don't know, but maybe one of the lessons is I need you to just figure out how to love them instead of trying to push them. Don't try to force them to do what you want. Just love them. Peter comes in. It's been a long night, man. He, he was hoping to get some fish. I mean, that's why he went out there, right? And yet he runs to Jesus. And once he sees Jesus, it's like all the fish don't matter. Like, oh yeah, Jesus got the fish. They were pretty important the night before, but now he sees Jesus and that's what happens with us. We can have very important things that seem like, oh, this is so weighty. And I'm not saying they're not weighty, but somehow when we just throw ourselves off the boat and run toward Jesus and we begin to get in his presence and we begin to gaze on his beauty and we see his sufficiency for us, we begin to sense, oh yeah, I'm seeing in perspective now that this thing is, it is weighty, but God is big and he's got my back. So maybe, maybe you blew up at work and you just were a total putz and a jerk and something like that. And you get out of work what could you do? Well, you could throw yourself into the car and get at Jesus' feet. And like, you know what? I just didn't do it right. And uh, I want to look to you right now and I want to receive your forgiveness. Help me, you know, just be better. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know why I was so grouchy. Help me out with this. Or maybe you're in a fight with a spouse and you're going through the same old stuff, same old again and again and again, but you're also twisting stuff. You're like trying to hurt them. How about you just throw yourself off the boat, run into the closet, Jesus, I need to look at Jesus for a minute. Would you just give me help right now? Lord, I, need, I know that you have all the sufficient, you have everything I need, but I need your power in order to love that person well right now. And we need to run. When I was a kid, some of you know about this. It didn't matter what we were doing. If we were playing ball, if we were riding bikes, whatever we were doing outside, because we were outside a lot in those times, As soon as you heard the jingle of the ice cream truck, it didn't matter what else was going on. You might be, you had a ball in your hand. You're like, this is dumb. I don't need this. And you run, you run to whoever has the money. And you're like, I need a lot of money right now. 
because this good humor man is coming and he's gonna skip us if we don't go. Everybody knows what it's like to make a mad dash for the ice cream truck. So that feeling, that's what we need to feel about Jesus. Here comes Jesus, I'm running. I gotta get to him. He's got my answer. He's gonna solve my problems. Now, I'm gonna meddle for a second. That means I'm gonna maybe get you offended. Um, I guess I, I mean this though with seriousness and with compassion and love. This thing can keep us from running to Jesus because it's a quick dopamine hit and it is endless. And sometimes we're feeling bad about ourselves. We're like, no, I, could, I, could, I could run to Jesus or I could just flip for, through this and, while, and it won't be the same thing. I won't get peace, but I'll be distracted and I'll see some different things. But you know what? The problem with this thing is it messes. You can't be all up into this and keep hearing the ebbs and flows of the Holy Spirit because he whispers, baby, and he will not have competitors. That's just not how it goes. And by the way, can I just say, this is total soapbox. Here we go. <laughs> Guys, we're not even very far into social media, right? We're what, maybe 20 years? Maybe. Um, did you know that like in the 20th century, it wasn't until the 1950s that they even knew cigarettes give you cancer, by the way. Like everybody was like, hey, this is great. If you would go back in time and be like, smoking is dumb, they'd be like, you're dumb. We're all smoking. <laughs> they found out in the 50s, oh no, it gives you cancer. I'm just saying, we should maybe be a little bit cautious. We don't have any wisdom about this thing yet at all. We don't have any perspective. And, and what I find about it, the, the, the effect I see it have on me and on some of y'all, social media constantly makes you audition for people's likes. And I, don't, I just don't like the, the, fact, the idea that I'm always auditioning. I don't want to audition my lasagna, all right? I don't want to audition what you think about, you know, my duck lips looking up at the thing, giving a kizzy face. I don't, I don't want to audition for you, and I don't want that effect on my spirit to feel like I need to audition for people. You know, I don't feel like I have to audition for you. You're real people. You're my family. I love you. All these bozos out there somewhere who are giving avatars of themselves that are kind of real and kind of not. I'm just saying, I think it has a negative effect on the soul long-term if we give ourselves to that completely. And so we might just want to hold back and have a look. I'm not, hey, it can be used by God for sure. But I'm just saying, if our heart is on this hamster wheel of, I have the addiction of approval and I need to audition for everybody to see if they like it. My friend, you don't need them to like you and you don't need to audition. Amen. We like you how you are, dude. You don't have to do anything. You're already loved, you're already liked by Jesus. So dear God, please, let's do something to lock this thing down so we can run to Jesus, please. Because more than good behavior and more than just giving you a mission, Jesus wants to be with you. Let's do one more. So we honor God's activity in our lives by running toward Jesus when we see him moving in our life, but we also point out God's work to others when you suspect he's working in their lives. Maybe, maybe you do it. You point it out in other people's lives, maybe. This is what uh, John did for Peter. Did you notice? Um, it's it's kind of worded funny. The disciple whom Jesus loved, verses verse seven, said to Peter, it is the Lord. So Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord and he cast himself into the sea. So John's watching this, okay? Peter is, he's looking at the fish. Oh my gosh. And then he looks at the man on the shore and then he looks at the fish and the man and the fish and the man. And he's like, this is just like it was before. Is that Jesus? I think maybe it is. And you know, John's over there and he's just more watching Peter and Jesus. And he's like, Peter, it's Jesus. I'm just confirming it to you, buddy. It's Jesus. And he's like, I knew, I thought it was Jesus. And then he jumps in the sea. John confirmed for his friend, hey, this really is the Lord. You're thinking it is. I just want to confirm. Yeah, I think it is. That's God. Why don't you go jump in the ocean with your clothes on? <laughs> See, our friends help us recognize Jesus in the circumstances of our lives sometimes. Now, we want to make sure that we guard everybody's process of self-discovery. This is what I needed to know as a young Christian that I didn't. But friends really are for giving a thumbs up, giving an attaboy, girl, or just saying, hey man, I see this and I don't think God has forgotten you. I think God really is gonna come rescue you at the right time and in the right way. Friends, uh, confirm things in one another's lives, but they have to give people space to find stuff out on their own. That's why it's, it was just, all John said was, it's the Lord. He didn't launch into a sermon. He said, let me give you three points on why I think this is the Lord, Peter. He just said, I think it's the Lord and off he went. My friend, 
There's something beautiful about discovering the treasure of Jesus hidden in a field for yourself. When someone explains everything about it, you don't get the joy of opening the present. I mean, just think about it. Okay, you know, somebody gives you a present and then they tell you what it is before you open it. It's like, well, dude, come on, man. I didn't want to know. I wanted to, I wanted to find out myself. There's a joy that comes only from finding out what was in there. And so we can encourage folks. We can give them little nods and nudges. But the best policy is if you over explain things to people, dude, they're going to run. They're going to be like, dude, I don't need this. I don't, I don't want you to be the Holy Ghost because you're not. Let me just find out on my own. Bra, back off. Let me do this. And they need time sometimes to figure it out. I think this is important for parents to remember. Okay, so Jacob, in Old Testament, right? His, his father's Isaac and Rebecca, and they're kind of backslidden, but for his whole life, they've been telling him that, you know, Yahweh is the true God and you need to follow this guy. And he kind of doesn't really get it. He doesn't seem to care. He's a deceiver, kind of just like his mom. And he gets into some trouble and then he gets out. He gets out of town. His brother Esau is after him and he's, he's in danger a little bit and he doesn't get very far. He's, he's about to go to his uncle Laban's to hide essentially. And he has an encounter with God and he says, and God, it's Jacob's ladder whole thing. And God's saying, hey, by the way, uh, Jacob, like I'm real and I'm gonna fill these promises to your family. And Jacob has the audacity to be like, All right, hey, cool, we'll see. I'm gonna go out with my life and we'll see what you do, God. Well, by the end of the 14 years when he's coming back, he's very much like, we're gonna do what God wants us to do. He's changed as he tried out finding out more about God, but it didn't happen in an instant. It didn't happen in a moment. And parents, sometimes, I don't want to scare you, but I think one of the best things we can do is pray for our kids because you want them to have a genuine faith. You want them to actually know Jesus, not just hear about the Jesus you know. But in order for that to take place, they got to have a little bit of difficulty, maybe a little bit of insecurity, maybe a little bit of ouch that you can't rescue them from or you shouldn't rescue them from it because they're learning, oh, God will help me, really. The God my parents always talked about He's really real, but I didn't launch out on him until people shut up and let me have my own trials and let me find out about who this God is. I need a parent to say amen if you think that's good. All right, we're almost there, friends. We're almost there. Sometimes you're gonna have what's called a prophetic word for somebody. You're just gonna feel it in your, in your gut. Like, I feel like God is saying this to you. I just wanna give you some advice about that. You, you can do that. As long as you say stuff like, I think maybe God might be saying to you, you don't want to come with, thus saith the Lord, you need to do this. You're even better if you come with the scripture and be like, I'm reading this and I think maybe this applies to you. But here's what we don't want to do as friends to one another. You don't want to back anybody into a corner and be like, you need to believe this. This is what God is saying to you. Guys, that's what cults do. That's not what Christians do. There's a Holy Spirit on purpose and it ain't you. So we don't, we don't tell people what to do. We don't presume to be teacher we just say, hey man, I love you a ton. I just want to suggest some things to you. And, and maybe what you want to do is, see this, if you just invite them to Easter next weekend, you don't even have to be the one telling them anything, right? And they won't think it's you. They'll, they'll hear the preacher talking and they'll feel the environment. And they'll, they'll be like, oh gosh, maybe they might, they might start to discern. Maybe God is at work in my life. But you can just take the pressure off you. You don't have to force them into anything. You don't have, you don't have to talk them into anything. All you have to do is, if God is moving, start to point stuff out by inviting them to an Easter worship experience next week. My friend, if we're gonna do this, um, you gotta get around other Christians. Sometimes I, I have to say to Christians, you need to get away from each other because you're not thinking about other people enough. But as a general rule, to do life healthily as a Christ follower, if that's what you are, you need to get around some peeps. So back to my construction days. I was one of three Christians on this construction crew that's tearing apart a hotel and putting it back together in kind of like a, a renewed way, like updating it. And us three Christians, we, we kind of felt like the people who were the bosses, they just didn't particularly like Christians and they weren't afraid to let you know it. And so anytime we could, it was kind of like a little bit covert. If we could get assigned to the same room, we would try because the rest of the environment was so antagonistic that we just had to, man, I'm just, I'm just glad to be with a brother. I'm just glad that we can, you know, we can paint this wall and not have to, and we can encourage one another as we go. You might want to go to Fierce Men just because, bro, it's an hour of your life, but you might have some brothers that have your back 
Lady, you might want to go to Fierce Women because it's only an hour of your life, but who knows? Someone might say one thing that you're like, now I know what God is doing in my life. Now I see it because of what you said. Now, let me give you three bonus questions, okay? These are questions that you can ask so you don't have to say, I think God is doing this in your life. Here's some things you can say to a friend. If this were a character test for someone in the Bible, how would they pass it? That's what you ask somebody. They're going through a hard time. Hey, I'm not telling you what to do, but I know you're really smart. If this were a character test in the Bible, how would that Bible character pass the test? Because that's what God wants you to do. Probably. You don't have to teach him. Another question. Hey, um, you bring the enemy into it. Some people don't even think about the enemy. And as soon as they do, they start to like, oh my gosh, yeah. You ask, hey, you're really smart. I know you're doing a lot right, but the enemy's also shrewd. What might the enemy be doing in this situation? If you were the enemy, how would you set you up knowing your proclivities to take you down? I know that I seem to know these real quick, but they'll come as you practice them. One more. You're really smart. You're not a baby. You've been through a lot of life and a lot of difficulty. Hey, I know you're going through a hard time, but tell me this. How would you encourage somebody who is going through what you're going through? Because I feel like most, most of us have already done that multiple times. Now let's just tell you again. My friends, Jesus doesn't just care about the mission, doesn't just care about you doing better. He comes to be with us. And he comes to cause us sometimes to be a part of how he's revealing his will to others. Let's pray. God, not one of us is doing this whole thing right. We do a lot wrong, as a matter of fact. I thank you, Jesus, that you just love us so much that you're just like, come have breakfast. You don't want anything to stop us or hold us back. I pray that that knowledge, knowing you that way, that we would all get it wave after wave after wave after wave. God, I pray that you would use us in one another's lives in, with discernment, not to like bludgeon people, but also to not let somebody just founder and not want to be, you know, a bother to anybody, but tell them the truth in love about what you might be doing. God, we invite you to make us a church where even if people had never been here before, they would walk in and they'd say, wow, these people know that Jesus loves them and they love others well because of it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Would y'all stand and sing with us? We're gonna sing a song. Uh, you may know it if you grew up in the church as a little kid. It's called It Is Well. It's done a little bit different than maybe what you're used to. But as we think through what the Lord has been doing in our lives and as we think through the people that he's placed in front of us, you might need to have a moment where you say, okay, yeah, Jesus, I'm gonna choose to say it as well with my soul. Even though, like the disciples who were sitting in that boat, they had just lost the very Jesus, the very man that they were following and they thought it was just all over. And they had a decision in that moment. Can I, can I trust that God is gonna do what he said he was gonna do? Can I trust that this Jesus, the Messiah that we hung all of our hopes on, is he gonna come through for me? So as we sing this, maybe consider the things that you're carrying with you, the things that feel heavy. Maybe consider the things that you're just uncertain about and lay them at his feet and trust that he's big enough to handle Through it all, through it all, my eyes 
are on you And through it all, through it all it is well So through it all, through it all My eyes are on you It is well for me and not believe even when my eyes can't see that this mountain that's in front of me it will be thrown into the midst of the sea Cause through it all through it all
eyes are on you And through it all, through it all it is well And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And it is well with me Yes, Jesus, we lay it at your feet we may not believe, we may not understand everything that's happening. But Jesus, we trust that you are in control and that you are strong enough for every situation that we face. So Jesus, like those disciples, we wanna just run after you. We wanna just get close to you. We wanna just have breakfast with you, spend time with you, keep our eyes fixed on you. Because we know that you have the answers for everything. I love you, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all can have a seat for just a second. So now we are in the part of the service where we get to honor the Lord and, and rejoice with the Lord in our giving. So, hey, if you came prepared to give, hallelujah, it's time to give. Uh, just like Pastor Carter said, everything that we have is already from Jesus to begin with, right? Our cup of coffee in that morning, that muffin, whatever we have, it's been given to us by the King of heaven and earth. So if you came prepared to give, there's all the different ways on the screen behind me. There's also giving bins as you walk out the door on the wall, or there's a giving kiosk. Um, we pray that as you, as you come to Fierce, this feels like family. This feels like your home and at your own home, right? You're, you're like, you make sure that things aren't falling apart, things aren't broken. Um, so if this is your home, you call Fierce your home, we pray that you would, you would feel the joy of helping take care of it, helping make sure that this place is a place that blesses other people, that honors God, and that we get to go out into the community and love people because of Jesus. So while you're getting that ready, if you need to, uh, let me tell you a couple different things. Uh, Pastor Brandon shared at the beginning of service, don't forget this coming Friday is our Good Friday service. This is an opportunity for us to get together, to slow down, to think about the sacrifice that Jesus made. This day is really the day that we slow down and we think about the cross. We think about all the things that we haven't done perfectly and the fact that really because of God's righteousness, his perfection, like we should be punished for that in like major big ways. But Jesus came on the scene and he took that punishment for us. So Friday night, we think about that. Come hang out with us, 7 p.m. Friday night. Remember, Saturday, we normally would have either Fierce Men or Fierce Women, and it's the fifth Saturday. So we are not meeting this Saturday. But then we hope that you will all come back on Sunday morning for our Easter service, our Resurrection Sunday service, where we get to remember Jesus did not just take all of our sins and die. He came back to life conquered over death and sin and the grave and our shame and he rose again so rejoice with us next sunday but uh take a look at the screen it's 9 and 11 o'clock not 10 don't come at 10 come at either 9 or 11 we would love to see you there hey can i close this out in a word of prayer all right jesus we just thank you for your presence we thank you that we get to look back to the days where you were here on earth in flesh and bone, just a man, but perfectly God at the same time. And you, you dwelt among us and you were just with us in all of it. God, as we walk through this holy week, as we walk through remembering what you did for us, God, would it transform us? And just like the people who encountered Jesus, there's, there's a scripture that says they couldn't stop testifying. They couldn't stop sharing about what you had done. God, help us this week to not stop sharing about who you are and what you've done and to bring everybody else in because you are the way maker and the miracle worker and the promise keeper. And so we love you, Jesus. We rejoice over you. We give you all glory and honor and praise. We pray that you would uh, be with us and manifest your presence in special sweet ways this week. In your name we pray, amen. All right, y'all. See you either Friday night or Sunday morning. Bye.